Hello again, and welcome to Astronomy Toronto. My name is Randy Atwood, and I am your host, and currently the president of the Toronto Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Behind me, you see, waiting on the launch pad, the Space Shuttle Challenger. And this edition of Astronomy Toronto will be looking at the first launch of a Canadian into space. During the next half hour, we hope to show you scenes of the Space Shuttle Challenger on the pad awaiting its launch scheduled for tomorrow morning, October 5th, 1984 at 7.03 in the morning. We'll show you the Challenger as the sun sets behind it, the astronauts, the seven astronaut team of the 41G Space Shuttle mission uh, leaving their quarters to go to the launch pad, and fingers crossed tomorrow morning at 7.03 we'll hopefully see the successful launch of the Space Shuttle Challenger. So all these things we'll be seeing, part, and also talking to some uh, people in the Canadian Space Program and the, show you some of the excitement and action here at the Kennedy Space Centre. The press site at the Kennedy Space Centre is situated next to the towering vehicle assembly building. It was first used during the Apollo program to assemble the mighty Saturn V moon rockets. The VAB, as it is known, is now used to assemble the space shuttle to the external tank and solid root rocket boosters. The orbiter and its boosters are joined together and then move the five kilometer distance to the launch pad. The press site is where all the members of press, whether it be TV, radio, or newspaper, assemble for uh, meetings before the scheduled launch and then early in the morning we all meet here, uh, we get ready in the grandstand and looking out over the water five kilometers in the distance we see the space shuttle on launch pad. The Kennedy Space Center and the adjoining Cape Canaveral is on the whole an expansive area of swampland. All of the land used to support the space shuttle launches had to be reclaimed the space shuttle is launched from the same launching pad as all the missions which sent men to land and walk on the moon. The shuttle is moved out to the pad about four weeks before a launch. There are two shuttle launch pads. Pad A has been used for every launch thus far. Pad B, seen here, will first be used in 1986. As can be seen from this view, it's a huge pit lined with brick to survive the fire and blasts of launch. The KSC is also a bird sanctuary. It's common to see flocks of birds flying around the launch pads as well as sometimes various other creatures. The closest anyone gets to the launch itself, apart from the astronauts and a few emergency crews, is about the distance of five kilometers. Uh, and that is on the other side, uh, out by the vehicle assembly building. That's why what we want to do is to get any pictures from, uh, from this side uh, to see the full orbiter, we have to set up remote cameras. This is a remote camera system that uh, uh, we've built, Michael Watson, Gary Atwood, and myself. And as you can see, there are four cameras set up here with wires and an electronic system. And what I want to do is show you how it works. Um, again, the box is just for uh, weather. That is, we have to set this up. It's, uh, well, 1.30 in the afternoon, the launch is scheduled for 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. So we have to have this set up now, and it'll have to be ready to, uh, to fire at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning when, uh, when the vehicle takes off. So that's what this electronic system is for. We have a small alarm clock, and with that, what we will do is set it so that uh, the system will not become active until about three minutes before, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, right up here uh, at the front of the box is a microphone that is the triggering mechanism. It gets incredibly loud, as we'll see tomorrow morning at the launch. Uh, even five kilometers away, the sound is just amazing. It, you have to experience it. Well, it's going to be much, much louder here. And that's what will happen. The system will be triggered by that microphone, but the clock mechanism is just so that it will not become active until a few minutes beforehand. Say if a thunderstorm came in tonight, and this has happened before. People have great shots of the, of the shuttle sitting on the pad during a thunderstorm, and then uh, they can't come out here to, uh, to reload the film. So right now, it's set up where uh, the system is triggered, and uh, it, it is quite sensitive to sound, but it has to be a loud sound. What I'll do is I'll get Mike come up here, to come up here and uh, to pretend to be an SRB tomorrow morning. And one more. Right, we'll do another one from the 
side here. And they'll just keep going. Uh, each camera shooting 36 frames until they run out of film. And uh, we have a, an 8 millimeter movie camera here. Uh, varying lenses. We have a 28 millimeter lens for a nice wide angle view, a 50 millimeter lens, and a 135 millimeter lens to get, get some really nice close ups. So, what we're going to do now is uh, load the cameras with film, close it all up, waterproof it, and head back to the, to the, uh, the press site. And fingers crossed, we'll have some uh, photos and we'll be able to show you, fingers crossed, some of these photos later on in the show. Back at the press site, I talked to Dr. Carl Deutsch and one of our astronauts, Roberta Bondar. Standing with Carl Deutsch, who's the director of the Canadian Astronaut Program. And my first question, uh, Carl, is how's everything going? Are we all set for tomorrow? Oh, yes. Everything's uh, going really well at the moment. We've got a happy crew and a happy set of experimenters. We're really looking forward to it. In, in, a, in just a few minutes, could you give us an overall uh, uh, version of what exactly you expect to uh, accomplish this mission experiment-wise? What, what Mark will be doing in the space shuttle? Yes, Mark is basically working in space technology, science, and life science side of things. And each of these has a different facet associated with it. In the technology, we're really giving eyes to robots um, in space, and uh, there are applications on Earth as well. So uh, we're developing that one. We're looking at how materials stand up to the harsh environment of space. Then we go into the science side of things, and there are some glows that go around the orbiter uh, when it passes at night, which might affect instruments, and we're going to quantify those a little bit better. And as well as that, we're going to be looking at the atmosphere from space. It's uh, very important to the sort of work that our scientists are doing in that area. And then finally, we go into the life science um, aspects, and our astronauts, as soon as they get into space, of course, have no gravity anymore. And that um, causes changes, uh, changes in how hard the hump heart has to pump, uh, changes in how they feel. And we're going to be investigating those. So Mark's going to have a busy time looking at all of these different aspects on each of the days that he's on orbit. Sounds like a lot of the experiments are for future ones. That is the life sciences, uh, the glow on the shuttle might affect a future Canadian experiment. Isn't that right? Yes, that's correct, um, but that's often the way of research and development. You take uh, little steps and then you use those steps to build um, from in your future programs. So um, that's uh, very definitely part of our methodology. I guess it might be said that you were the one that uh, had to make uh, the big decision of who would go up, and I guess you did have some input into who would be chosen for, for uh, who would be an astronaut out of the 43 candidates, isn't that right? Yes, that's correct on both counts. Are you happy with uh, your decisions? Oh yes, I'm not at all unhappy either with the choice of six that we have there, a super group of people, or with Mark and Bob as a backup, as a matter of fact. They've really worked as a wonderful team, and um, I'm sure that we'll all be proud of them. And you, the idea is that someday all six may even have a chance to go up, isn't that right? What, what are the chances of that? Well, at this moment we have a program with three flights, um, so that means three people. Uh, obviously, uh, we'll be reviewing the program as it proceeds, and if there's good reason for carrying on, um, I'm sure that the, we won't have any of those six um, passing up a chance to fly. But, but as of now, there's only, uh, is there funding for three flights? Yes, we have approval for three flights at this time, and that's all. What will be the schedule for the first Canadian astronaut once he comes back down to Earth? Will uh, people across the country get a chance to see him? Very much so. Um, first of all, there'll be the debriefing from the mission, which takes place here at Johnson. Uh, but then uh, he comes back to Ottawa, and round about the middle of November, he'll be going to every provincial capital in Canada. This might be a difficult question, but of uh, all the little apprehensions you have, what might be your one apprehension as uh, we stand uh, three miles away from the orbiter on the eve of the launch? Well, I'm very comfortable at the moment, but the biggest apprehension, um, obviously, is that um, something goes wrong. Um, because we've all worked very hard for a successful program here, and if something goes wrong in a major way, that would be very disappointing to us. But we don't have any fear of that happening. I'm with Roberta Bondar here, and uh, I guess the question I have for you, Roberta, is how are you feeling right now? Top of the world. Pretty exciting. <laughs> yeah, well, really. We just, uh, uh, as every hour uh, goes by and the minutes uh, get closer and closer to launch, um, well, right now I'm just constantly smiling. I have these cracks in my face, I think, by the time so excited. What will be your response? Well, first, let me let's talk about uh, the training. Uh, what was your responsibility support support wise for this flight? I had two basic responsibilities. One is that I'm a principal investigator for one of the neurological experiments on board dealing with the um, 
taste, it's called the taste and smell experiment. It's really another way of looking at how the nervous system uh, resets itself to flying in uh, less gravity uh, situation. And we're just testing uh, taste on the tongue because it's the nervous system supplies taste. Uh, the second part of my uh, commitment to the program has been to support the other experiments on board. Uh, we have helped refine some of the experiments for the space adaptation syndrome, per se, as well as we've come down and helped go through the safe review panels and this type of thing. Uh, so that there have been a, a wide variety of things in the support role as well as the role I've had as PI. I think everyone's interested in the taste aspect because it's something we can really re uh, relate to. If uh, someone goes up into space, does the food taste different after a while? Well, it's, someone has told me once that one of the problems with the taste up there with the food is that it's institutional type food. I guess as everybody knows who's eaten in the hospital for a while, uh, the food always tastes the same at the end. But there's more than just that to it. Uh, astronauts comment that foods taste sweeter. Some people notice they taste less spicy. But it's, very, it's a very individual response so that we look at how people taste down here and then we look at how they taste up there and see the difference for that particular individual. I guess uh, talking about the space adaptation or space sickness, anyone who's uh, taken a few rides on a roller coaster knows that it can be very uncomfortable. What are, what are we looking for in this flight? Just uh, say a few indications of why people get sick or what you can do about it? Space adaptation syndrome experiments encompass more than just motion sickness. Uh, they encompass all kinds of ways the nervous system is trying to adapt to the space environment. The motion sickness part is just one small uh, portion of those experiments. But to answer your question, we are basically taking Mark and looking at him as a subject and to get more uh, data points. In other words, there will be a whole pile of people that go up and the more information we have as to what their susceptibility is, how soon they recover, does it interfere with their work, is there anything we can do to, to alleviate the, the, uh, the cause of it, will help us understand the whole mechanism of motion sickness, both in space and here on Earth. What, what is the, uh, the morale of the uh, whole crew right now? Everyone's pretty excited, going to be supporting Mark, I guess, for the next eight days. I think we're already, all of us are in <laughs> orbit, even <laughs> without him. <laughs> Have you, it's been a lot of work, and I think this is something that uh, a lot of people don't realize. You've been working your, your tail off for the last eight months, I'm sure, and this is, I guess, the, the whole being down here is a bit of a, a vacation for you. Uh, has it been a lot of fun? It's been so much fun that the hard work really has gone, has passed us all without us really being very, very conscious of it being hard work. We've all tried to pitch in. Uh, each one of us have had different tasks to perform, whether it's been developing the space vision system experiments, some of the engineers have been doing, or the life science experiments. We've been putting in lots of extra hours, uh, but we want everything to go so well for, for Mark and for Canada that it's, it's been fun and it's been a pleasure putting in those hours. And again, when is the, uh, after this, when is the second flight of a Canadian astronaut uh, scheduled right now? We have two uh, proposed flights in 86, I guess early 86 and late 86. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not, we don't, have not been given the, the launch date yet, of course, the manifest is out, so that we don't know at this point uh, what month it will even be in. Is this your first launch? No, I was here for Discovery, which was my first launch, the last one, and that was really spectacular, beautiful, clear day, and it was just you got to be down here to see them to really get the bug, don't you? You really do. You have to get the feeling of the, the impact of the sound waves reverberating off your chest and just to see that little flash of light and then suddenly you hear the sound, which is delayed, of course, and then to see it climb up and the, 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 the smoke and everything billowing out and getting larger and larger and larger as it climbs up further. It's, uh, it's incredible. And uh, we'll be seeing something different this time because instead of going a bit south, it'll head north. It'll right, 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 right to Canada. <laughs> right up the coast. Doing a U-turn going right for Nova Scotia. Right. Thanks, Roberta. Have a good time tomorrow. Thank you very much. And good luck on the mission. Thank you. Thank you. Off you go. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Later that evening, with about 12 hours to go to launch, the press were taken out to view the rollback of what's called the rotating service structure. This is a large structure which is built to enclose the orbiter when it's on the pad. This serves se several functions. It not only protects Challenger from the weather, but it also allows workmen access to the orbiter. Well, this really gave our first opportunity to see Challenger on the pad. And as the sun set, intense, brilliant lights were turned on to light up the entire vehicle. It was really quite a beautiful sight. This is something that NASA calls a photographic opportunity. 
and uh, it certainly was a, a fine opportunity to get some really high quality photographs. Along with Challenger, you may remember there are two other orbiters which are being used these days to send astronauts into space. Challenger is uh, flanked by the orbiter's Discovery and Columbia. It's really quite an awe-inspiring sight to look at the shuttle when it's all lit up this way. Not only to remember what's going to happen within a few hours, but also to think about where Challenger would be spending its next eight days. Back at the press site, around midnight, we were able to witness the spectacle of the pad and shuttle being lit up by those intense searchlights. They must have been visible for about 30 kilometers. At 3 a.m., we were taken to the operations checkout facility to wish the astronauts well as they walked out of their building, and we waved to Mark Garneau, wished him for all of Canada to have a successful and enjoyable flight. The astronauts were taken out to the launch pad to board the space shuttle, and we returned to the press site to be greeted by just a spectacular dawn. With just over 30 minutes to go to the launch, we were all intent listening to what mission control and launch control had to say about the upcoming launch and preparations. Any unplanned hold after T minus 31 seconds will result in an automatic cutoff of the countdown and an automatic recycle to the T minus 20 minute mark. The shuttle launch control at T minus 20 minutes and hold. We're just a few seconds from coming out of this hold, and Mark, we are counting. As we come out of the hold, Challenger's onboard computers transition into the terminal countdown configuration, and we will dump the computer memory of one of the four primary computers so that we can look at it and make sure the Ops 101 program has been stored properly with no unexpected results. Because this launch was taking place about a half hour before sunrise, it would look very unusual to us. We would expect to see the space shuttle launch in darkness and rise and meet the sunrise about 30 seconds after launch. The cloud cover began to move in and we wondered how much of this launch we would really see. You may be a bit surprised as you watch this launch to see the engines fire up and the shuttle rise into the sky about 15 seconds before you hear anything. Well, that's because of the great distance between the pad and us at the press site. So enjoy this launch, the launch of the first Canadian astronaut, Mark Garneau, on October 5th, 1984. Here we go. Go! Go, baby! Woo! Oh, look at the brightness of that. Oh. All right! Geez, whatever, bright, eh, Mike? Space shuttle launches are a spectacular sight, but very difficult to photograph. Here are the pictures that Michael Watson and myself took from the press site as the space shuttle cleared the tower. Once the solid rocket boosters clear that tower, the brightness increases dramatically. We didn't know it, but our remote sight cameras got some just spectacular photos. This is what it looked like the day before. 
And this is what it looked like just a few seconds after launch with a wide angle lens. And the colors are quite extraordinary as the space shuttle goes up into the clouds. This is a closer view now, a 135 millimeter photograph of the main engines firing up and the solid rocket boosters igniting and the space shuttle just leaping up off the tower. And again, the camera has to close down to compensate for the very, very bright solid rocket booster flame. The color change in just such a few seconds was quite extraordinary. We're very, very pleased with these results. Even the 8mm movie camera got a very good view of the launch. Although rather fleeting. We're going to get SRBs. What are SRBs? That's the when solid rocket boosters peel off. And you can you got a time? Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. We're getting, uh, we're getting close. Give me a two minute. We're coming up to two minutes. Just a couple of seconds. I got SRV set. Really? Yeah. Okay. 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 Oh, you can really see the SRVs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can. We still got the, uh, the engines. Michael, we just got some spectacular uh, photographs at that remote site. Look at, look at that. Look at the shadow. Take a picture of that. That's the shadow of the SRB trail. Yeah. That is unreal. Okay, look at that. Look at that. That is absolutely fantastic. Oh. The view of the smoke trail after the launch was nearly as spectacular as the launch itself, just because of the different kinds of chemicals and different lighting conditions which lit up the SRB smoke trail to give us such a beautiful, beautiful view. Well, this has been a personal reflection on a trip that I'm sure Michael and I will never forget. Uh, we've both seen a couple launches now and uh, it's very difficult to convey in words and pictures and video uh, just exactly how uh, spectacular something like this can be. If any of our viewers today do get a chance to see one of the numerous space shuttle launches that will be taking place in the future, we highly re recommend that you take one in because it certainly is a, a spectacular show. We were also very proud to be down for such a historic event to see the first Canadian go up in space and we'll look forward to seeing more Canadians go up because as time goes on, uh, space is going to be the place for Canada to be.